Um, so if you take a look at this monstrosity, it's a four unit panel, uh, basically as wide as an easel is. And it's kind of broken up into uh, three sections, I'd say. Uh, the first two sections um, are what we call them section A and B are kind of the, I don't know, we'd say the brains of the... Yeah. Yeah, the the transport controls and the outputs, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much going on. And then the middle, and so basically it, you you jump from back and forth between section A and section B. And you have uh, on the far right side a set of, uh, two sets of 16 sliders. One is for the output voltage level up top, and one is the interval time below. And the output level voltage goes up to 2 volts, although there's a jumper to change that to 1.2, but the default is 2 volts. And the interval time goes up to 30, which will be 30 seconds if you have that set as the cycle in the operating mode. Yeah, and then in the... the time range. Yeah, so then the last section is the middle, which is where all the programming happens, where you can start to program... Um, whole bunch of different parameters for each step um, going from uh, putting in pulses per step you can do up to two um, and then you have your output voltage section which runs through if you want the voltages to be quantized if you want them sloped instead of stepped uh, their full range off the slider um, or you can uh, there's also kind of a, an octave switching system in here and then also delete or defining the steps from uh, how long, how many sets of steps you want to use for each section, and uh, and then the time range, which goes from a very fast point zero zero two um, up two, to two hundredths of a second. Yeah, two hundredths of a second up to thirty seconds, um, and and those set the base time range. In seconds, which then are manipulated by the sliders and on the interval time, yeah, so, you know the bottom section. There's like three dimensions of time on this yeah. thing, which is pretty neat because you can have your range, which sets how much uh, control the inter each interval time slider will give it, and then you have a time multiplier back on section A and section B, which can, um, yeah, which you have your range in there, so you can get some really. Uh, lengthy times i mean you basically get two minute stages if you want to the time multiplier knob goes in a range from 0.5 and yeah. counterclockwise to four in clockwise so it's a decent decent range that four is going to be extraordinarily fast if you have it set to 200 no it's, it's the other way so oh, it's I have going that, yeah, down. I have that backwards yeah because it's a multiplier yeah so you're multiplying by 0.5 so it's going to be half so, <laughs> so you can still get yeah. So you can even get yeah down to I guess that's it's an imperceptibly <laughs> imperceptibly. So the thing I love about the Marf, um, Kyle got me really interested in this. And, you know, I'd always seen it, but this programming interface. You know, we consider that this came out in like what nineteen seventy seven or seventy five. No, it's like seventy three, even earlier than yeah, because Suzanne had it by her seventy five recordings. And that's right. So yeah, I think it's seventy three is when it came out. And not and, too many of them were made. And it seems inconsequential that that's only four years, but a lot happened in computers in those four years. So in the old days of computers, you know, there were punch cards and stuff. But around the late 60s, early 70s, the digital computers that had a programming interface on the computer itself worked like the MARF, where you moved through different, they weren't really stages, they were registers, but you moved through the registers and then flipped switches to set a binary value of one or zero. Mm -hmm. And as the computer moved, you know, went through the registers of memory to perform operations, it would result in a calculation as an output. So, and that, that might be a discussion for another podcast, but the MITS Altair, which came out in around 1974 and was the basis for the founding of Microsoft and the MSI 88, I think the MSI 8080, which you can see in the movie War Games, they both had these switch style programmings as you shifted through the registers of memory and you know, turn things on and off. And then for your computer nerds out there, we know that was replaced with assembly language um, a little bit later in the microcomputers. So I love this interface because it's very tactile, you know, and hands-on. And as you move through the stages and the little light 
lights up underneath the output voltage level and above the interval time, and then you flip a range switch, you know, and you can see the light changes. I just think that's amazing. Yeah, and that. I guess what we haven't kind of mentioned is um, almost every switch is is spring loaded, so it's just a I don't know, it's a very foreign way, I guess, with within the Eurorack world and everything else that I've ever interacted with. Yeah. Um, Let me let folks hear this. Hold on. <laughs> Yeah, so you can hear just like a lot of click clacking. <laughs> I'm such a nerd for that, that stuff. It, I don't know. It's great. It's I don't know. It sounds weird to try and talk about <laughs> the experience of <laughs> it is, yeah. Doing it, but it's I don't know. It's 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 like a very hands on way of of uh, menu diving. If you yeah will. yeah that that's exactly right yeah rather than a screen though like on an ornament of crime or you know, my two, two my two TT. And you're scrolling, you're scrolling and scrolling, and, 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 scrolling. and clicking the encoder to make stuff happen. You're you're doing the same thing here, when setting the switches, but it's a tactile. I don't want to say analog, but it kind of is this tactile experience of on or off for each switch because they are spring loaded. You know, one position switches so push up for on and then push up for off, and they're either you know it's a bit uh, for most of them. So the, as you move through the stages, even really fast while it's running, you can see all the different settings mm -hmm. for that stage instantly. And of course, being four panels wide, there's plenty of room for all these LEDs to show you those things too, which is um, makes this just such an amazing. This is why this has been such a is such a performance controller mm -hmm. and sequencer. You know, totally different from the 250e, 251, 252, and you know the other sequencers and such because it's much more than just a sequencer. And I think the LEDs and seeing what's going on at each stage, even as it's moving through the stage or moving through them, is really important if you're going to do changes to the sliders in the performance. Yeah. Because you you know, you can anticipate like I'm moving the slider number uh, number four just with my finger here. And I'm a mad you know, you can imagine as it's moving through the stage and I'm moving that slider, I can see as it's you know sixteen, here comes step four. And that's where the slider is. And I can flip a switch even when it's on the stage live. There's just so much you can do with this. Yeah. So I guess let's kind of break it down through some of also what's called cool the, the output section of each of the sections. Uh, there's just a ton of, there's six different outputs on each section. And then there's two of them. So, um, so first off, there's just the straight up voltage uh, output, which is reading what's on the top row of sliders. Let's, here, let's hear that. So it's stage one. So. And if you quantize that. Cool. Um, and then there is the time slider, uh, or sorry, time voltage out, to which we can it's just going to be the same thing if we turn it back up. But there's not a ton of... Um, uh, there's an, Basically, the, the output voltage section, uh, you have all these modifiers that you can put on it, like we just showed you, that quantized section, um, where the time, it's just reading reading out what how much voltage is coming out of there. Um, what's also cool is this, uh, what they call the reference out, and what that is, is basically, a, it's like a pulse. It's kind of like the pulser on the music easel. So yeah. it's just a, is it just a decay envelope because it's, it's full? It's kind of like, I think it's based on the full length of the time interval. Whereas a pulse is going to just fire the pulse when it, the stage starts. Yeah, but pulse is like on off where yeah. where if you scope like the pulser on the easel. It's kind of like a sustain. Right? Yeah, like it just, it. You know, it's just a ramp down wave is what that is. And, yeah. it, and each step uh, will be the full or the full length of that step or that's what that will be. So if we get that going, let's see here. Oh, maybe I've oh, got the wrong. Kyle now. plugged in the wrong patch cord. <laughs> Slider three, go ahead. Yeah, so let's if we move them all up. And that's the range is set to point three. Uh, point three. Yeah, point three or two tenths of a second. Okay. 
So what it's useful for is, I guess, if you want kind of a rhythmic hit with every, that's going to match the length of each step, um, that's that's what you got there. Yeah. Instead of trying to um, set up an envelope that's going to somehow uh, follow that same. Yeah, and just because we didn't point that out, the ref output was going to the uh, level input on the 292E. So it's basically acting like an interval, or I'm sorry, like an envelope. Uh, we were bypassing the 281. Um, and that is really interesting too, Kyle, because if you have pitches set here and you're shaping the envelope here and you're going in the 282, 282, uh, the 292, you can also use the pulse to do something else on the 281. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we can set up, let's see here. So let's just, let's show a set of pitches. In here, so we've got like we'll make this is a four step sequence, and then let's just make uh, step two. We'll program an alpha pulse. Yeah, so that's doing a envelope to the uh, wave shape of the 258. Let's slow this down, let's move these up. Just by kind of moving the intervals and time sliders, you can just get so much from it. Yeah. And I think looking at it as like using this as a sequencer, I think that's kind of unique. Um, I don't. I guess I'm not super well versed with with sequencers in general, but having so many options per step uh, to change the timing of it. Yeah. The um, so the 251e, for example, you can set an interval time per step, um, and it's one, two, three, four, eight, and 16, I think, and there might be a way to get in there tight, but, and, you know, as you navigate through each step with the encoders, and then the 250E, you can set the interval length for a step, but it's not, it's not like this. Mm -hmm. It's different from this. Um, maybe it's because of the menu diving that's necessary in those two sequencers, and thus my knowledge of them is going to be innately limited because here you just look at the switches and you know instantly that that you can do that but yeah. the i'm i have my marf and within you know a week of having it i was able to do this type of thing where i still can't quite figure out how to get a one fifth interval on my 251e mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which it might be able to do that and i'm sure a listener is going to send me an email and say here's how you do that which would be fantastic where should they email us Oh yeah, source um, source of uncertainty pod at gmail dot com. Yeah, or info at source of uncertainty dot audio. So you pick whichever really long email address, <laughs> and feel free to get at us. Um, but yeah, so we kind of showed a bit of how to use it for uh, pitch sequencing, but there's so much you can do with it. I use it as um, like a preset voltage manager where like if I'm have, if I'm using maybe kind of two different songs in a set and I want to have just a bass tuning different, I'll have these ready to go to plug into the, to the easel to change one of the oscillators. And, um, you can use it as oh, any type of envelope. You can think of a 16 step envelope. Um, and we're kind of going to get into a few patches right now that shows off a few things that this thing can do. Um, but I don't know. I think I've had this since November of 2018, and I still feel like I'm just scratching the surface oh, with yeah. it. Oh, we'll, yeah. We'll never master this. Yeah. We just won't live long enough. And that's what's so fun about this one. Yeah. I, I love this uh, because I do a lot of, I guess I do a lot of kind of complex modulations of things and I like to have 
um, a very ha tactile, hands-on change to wave shapes and, and stuff like that. And then using the 251E and sending a pulse out from an individual stage on the MARF to kick off a sequence on the 251E, which will then end. And that, that's really, and so you kind of kind of use this like a pulse sequencer in a way yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the rhythm generator yeah. and yeah, that's very cool. So an arbitrary function. I guess I, we really know what that means now. <laughs> Yeah, it. I, we. I guess I understand why you didn't call it some sort of, you know, sequential voltage source because, yeah, you can make it be <laughs> whatever you can dream up. Yeah, pretty much. All right, Robert. All right, it's time. We're gonna build a multiple arbitrary function. Don't you mean patch. generate a multiple arbitrary function patch? Yeah, what you said <laughs> that works. All right, so we're going to use section A to do some, we're going to sequence some notes with it. So we're going to make this uh, eight-step patch. So we'll start by uh, selecting uh, stage one, and we're going to press the uh, first stage for that to, to notate that we've got that being our first stage. And then we're going to click over to... Uh, to number eight, and then we'll put our last stage on there. And when you do that, for the first stage, there's a red light on stage one that says first, and then on stage eight, the red light for last is lit up. Yeah, so, I'll, you know, Don's always thinking about where to, uh, to give us good visual feedback of what's going on. So when you do get the MARF going, it's very cool to watch it, kind of all the lights jump around showing you what's happening within the patch. Um, all right, so I've got those set up from one to eight, and I will plug that into an oscillator, and I'm gonna have the output voltage plugged in here. So if I start that, so that's running super fast um, because we haven't changed our time range at all. Uh, so. It's running at the uh, 0.3 time range for all eight steps. So I'm going to go and turn all those to our three-second stages. And the interval time sliders are all set to the very bottom. Yeah. So that would be the minimum time per stage based on that interval that you set with the switch, right? Yeah, exactly. So I've bumped that up, so it's going to go slower now. So now when we bring that up... And it's a little wiry and erratic, so I'm going to turn on the uh, quantize section for every step. So then that sets everything within the uh, uh, quantize range of the 12 volts. So we've got our sequence of notes going on this side. Um, I'm also going to use the reference out to uh, adjust the low pass gate. So instead of just turning it up and having that string of notes like that, I'll put it up, plug it into the reference. That sounds really good. So I'll unplug that for now because we're going to focus now on section B of the MARF. So I'm going to hit the display switch. And so with the other remaining steps, I'm going to make two different envelopes. I'm going to have one that will be triggered by the uh, 223. And it's just going to be a super simple attack decay. And then, uh, then we're going to have a few steps that's going to have, um, we're going to throw some sloping in there, leave some steps uh, stepped, and, uh, and see what that sounds like, too. And we're not using the 281E for this right now. The voltage outputs are going straight into the um, levels input on the 292E. So, plug, so I'm plugging in pulses from the uh, 223 to adjust the start and strobe sections of section B. And right now we just have a 
uh, kind of a drone going on right here. But when I press the section of the two, two, three, we can now trigger this envelope whenever we want to. But what's cool is we have um, uh, section M of the 223. When we hit that, it's going to play a looping envelope. You kind of hear a couple clicks in there, and that's because of some are stepped and some are sloped. Yeah, like almost like an attack per stage. And, you know, that stepping makes it sound like there's an attack on those first two stages. Yeah. So if I go, so if I bring in our other sequence. Sounds cool. But uh, let's make this a little bit more arbitrary. So I'm going to... Um, I'm going to set up a pulse. I'm going to jump back to uh, to section A, and I'm going to use the program pulses. I'm going to enter one in, I think, on our third step of the sequence, and I'm going to have that pulse a 281 envelope to the wave shape of our, of our droney oscillator over there. So now when we hit it... Actually, let me... And I'll throw in our Obviously, like not working in time with each other, so they can kind yeah. of get out of phase, and and uh, that sweep of the uh, wave shape comes in and out. And there was a really cool effect that um, I mean, I, we could really put the time into figuring out exactly how to make it work out. But the wave shape of oscillator A on the two fifty eight, there's a point where the shape of the wave is in the same pitch class as oscillator B, so they're in they're in tune. But because of the timing of the envelope. And the time and the interval times on the two forty eight, it's not exactly predictable when that will happen, but it is in the same pattern over and over again. So it was really cool to listen for that. Yeah, so that's one way of setting up the uh, multiple arbitrary function generator. So now we're going to get into what we're calling the Chiani method. So excited! Um, and what a uh, big part of the MARF that we haven't talked about yet is the external inputs that can be used. So. Uh, I don't know how to kind of describe this, but it, it can kind of be like a CV. The Marf can be used as like a CV uh, matrix mixer. Um, you'll see these uh, on if you're looking at the Marf. It also, along all the 16 steps, it uh, also delineates A, B, C, and D as you go up the slider uh, sweep. And that goes for both the interval time and the uh, output voltage. And so each step you can set it to basically not in turn not read the internal voltage that you're getting with these sliders, but stuff that's coming in through these four in uh, external inputs labeled A, B, C, and D. So whatever position that you have the slider set at, it will then have the external voltage run through the MARF and out through the output voltage. And and why do you think someone would want to do that? <sighs> Make this. To have somebody, I mean, like, yeah, what was like, Don? What was Don thinking? Yeah. Why do you think Don added, just you know, randomly? Like, why does are there four external inputs that map to A, B, C, and D? And I, I can't think of another thing that does that. I mean, another sequencer or anything like that. No. I, yeah, I know. Yeah. That's yeah. Like, I wish we had him here. To, yeah. uh, <laughs> well, I was I wasn't trying to put you on the spot. <laughs> I mean, I know what we're about to do, but you know, just kind of thought as much as we've spent time on this and using it. We're like, oh yeah, put in the external input. We never really talked about wh why someone would want that. 
Well, uh, I think we probably will be talking to somebody that uh, that figured out uh, probably the best use of this. Yeah, uh, you, might, you might be right there. Uh, so yeah, Suzanne um, from her famous kind of uh, what's it called the the um, her paper that she wrote oh, for, yeah, for the, uh, the the grant proposal. Yeah, it was like National Endowment for the Arts or something like that. Um, when she wrote her uh, uh, her pay her paper back in 1975, four seventy five, um, this was included with her release for the 1975 album um, that she put out a few years ago through Finders Keepers. So we've uh, taken a look at that and tried to kind of recreate how Suzanne uh, was using her uh, Marf back then and kind of way that she still does now. So what we have going is. Um, from the 251E, which is a, a, a quad uh, sequential voltage source, which is basically four sequencers um, that we have running into each of the A, B, C, and D inputs. And so, what that, and so we've also punched uh, the notes on the sequences to match hers that she used because that's in her, her paper as well. Yeah, each, each stay or each um, section of the 251E corresponds to each of the four stages that she has in the the sheet music for this. So for stage one, we've gone through all 15, 16 steps and programmed the control voltages to match the notes and, and, and uh, set the interval links. And then we have the tempo set to 300. All right, so let's start the sequence. That sounds, that sounds familiar. Yeah, if you've... Uh... Yeah, any of Suzanne's buccal music in, in the nineteen seventy five or the yeah, live she, quadraphonic. She, yeah, she doesn't. She still performs this. I, I'm I'm transported to New York City in seventy five. <laughs> so, uh, so we just have section A um, of the MARF on stuck on uh, step one, and so as we move step one of the slider up into B, we're gonna move to the next yeah. set of sequences. So this is the. Section B of the 251E sending a sequence to the external input B on the MARF. And then we'll move it up to C. And now sequence uh, stage, uh, sequencer C of the 251 and then D. That's really cool. So, if we want to stop this for a second, then what we're going to do, so what she has, and she does this in all different types of ways, but what we've kind of set up is for that so we can move kind of scale through the different um, the different note sequences with the first slider on section A of the MARF. But when we move over to section B, we have um, pulses coming out from the 251 sequencer into the uh, 266 source of uncertainty. So we're getting some quantized random voltages. And what we're going to do over here, what Suzanne would um, use as the because it's being kind of clocked separately by the um, by the pulse the pulses of the two fifty one e, it's going to um, and the random it's going to jump around in time, and what she will do is move the time sliders up to provide voltage out of the MARF into her wave shape yeah. um, of the oscillators that she's using, so if we start. Okay. And we have this going into the 258E, so the wave shape will move from a sine to a square. So if we start it back up, and we move. So randomly, as I move up a few s stages of the time interval, it'll accent those notes. I'm, I'm sitting here watching it. I'm completely mesmerized by the. Like, I, 
don't even know what you're saying anymore. I'm just watching the LEDs bounce around. And I, I think this really goes to show um, about how focused she is on it being a performance instrument and how um, imperative it was that she has her mark in order to, um, yeah, to, to play on the fly, to, to um, improvise. thing yeah and, and just to kind of recap we're using the 251e 258e um dual oscillator and the 266e source of uncertainty and then the 281 292 and so not a lot of modules on the 200e side you know the marf is really the one providing most of the magic and um it's it's a as just if you see in the video it's it's not a particularly complicated patch there's a lot of patch cables because of the the four channels of the 251e but is that really it's not a lot of going on here in terms of patch. Yeah, and if you look at hers, I mean, she she then will have um, sometimes the Marv clocking the other sequences and back and forth. So she has a lot of different ways to kind of um, open it up to um, uh, tempo changes and things like that. And we didn't even get into the um, switching octaves or, or, or adding slopes and stuff to that, the way that it can be processed through the Marv as well. Um, but you know what? We should just talk to the lady herself. Let's do it. Can't wait. 